Don Schreiner. I'm with Minnesota Sea Grant. I am a fisheries aquaculture specialist. And we're here today to talk about aquaculture and hydroponics and the bait business, all wrapped into one. Um, our goal is to try to help the viewers understand what it takes to put a business like this together. And beyond the methods and the, and the equipment, I think one of the most important things we that Barry can help us with is to help us understand what it actually takes to do this sort of work. How to, do you have the right stuff? I got into this business as a fishing guide. I needed bait. I wasn't able to get it, so I started catching my own. Um, I saw the issues with declining populations in the wild and started looking at ways to grow the fish my own, myself. I uh, also saw that uh, I needed a more consistent income, so I added hydroponics into it. I married my wife. Uh, she was uh, owned this piece of property. Uh, one thing led to another, and uh, the property has water, a high water table. So we began digging ponds in there. We have 13 ponds on the property now, along with 7,000 square feet of hydroponic greens. Uh, we produce primarily romaine lettuce, uh, cherry tomatoes, tomatoes, strawberries, cucumbers, zucchini squash, uh, herbs for local sales, several food cups, uh, food co-ops, and several resorts. Predominantly, Horny Head Shop and uh, Common Shiner, but we also do research and I wild harvest common sh or, uh, um, spot tail shiners and we do research into uh, better management practices for common shiner. Can you give us just a little bit of an overview before we get into some specific questions about how you do your bait industry, you know, how you capture them, whether you're growing them on site? I started out um, wild harvest, but watching the decline over the years of these po of these populations, mainly because how they're harvested, I started looking at growing the fish on site. Uh, I'm trying to get away from uh, the ebbs, ebbs and flows of nature. Uh, we had years where we had high water, we couldn't get, get the fish because we couldn't get into the rivers. Uh, most of my harvest takes place in the rivers, except for early spring when we go after lake shiners. You know, we're standing in front of your distribution truck here, which is a big part of your business, right? Yeah. How do you control the environment once the fish are in the tank? Well, these tanks are homemade. Um, they, we use pure oxygen um, for uh, transporting fish. Um, I don't use agitators because the, the fish tend to swim into current and they brush against the agitator so that causes damage to the fish, scrapes the, the uh, slime layer off the outside of the fish. My fish are caught in the wild and brought back and put in ponds. So we transport in warm water. Uh, pure oxygen works best and then we use ultra fine pore diffusers so that I get the, the most bang for my buck with the oxygen. Uh, we use less oxygen than most people do because we, we have smaller bubble size and better diffusion into the water. Um, I built these tanks for long transport. We can we can run fish for six to eight hours in the tank without any real issues. Uh, but we also do have to consider that I am transporting in warm water, so I don't overload the tanks. Do you ever transport directly to a bait shop, or do they all come to your farm first? They all come to my farm. This. Because I have the ponds here, it gives me the ability to harvest in the wild, bring them back, put them in the pond. I have feed that I can I can keep the fish fed, um, and then I can sell them as needed when I need it, when the market demands it, um, rather than having to dump them at, at a bait shop. Well, we stopped at a bait shop on the way here, Barry, and there were some empty tanks. One said Shiner, the other one said Sucker. Is that typical? Uh... It hasn't been until the last couple of years. Um, this year, the grow-out has been slow. Um, we also have drought conditions, which have uh, really curtailed the, the uh, um, amount of ponds that people can stock. And we lost a lot to the winter kill last year, so we don't have a lot of carryover. Plus, two years ago, they only got about 60% of the egg take that they normally take uh, for sucker eggs. 
Um, so they didn't have the fry count, they weren't able to stop the ponds, and that affects the market two to three years down the road. Well, I got two 6,500 gallon ready wall pigs. This one has common shiners and red tailed chubs. Uh, the other one has golden shiners. For, these are both research projects to see if I can get them up to saleable size, marketable size, maybe here, which is about three inches. Um, these, you can see out here, are pretty aggressive. They're they're friendly. They don't want here, so I haven't started naming them yet. But you know, it might come down the down the road yet. This is um, two different sizes of feed that is uh, sized for the fish that I'm feeding. Um, these are pretty small. They're ranging anywhere from probably an inch long to up to two two and a quarter inches long. Um, this is Otahimi. Um, fish food, which is uh, imported. Um, next week we'll be switching over to Ziegler's um, formula and hopefully that'll work as well. So these get pretty aggressive down here and there. Uh, I'm using the feeders, uh, these uh, shakers, to distribute the food and you almost have to work with prevailing winds. So they're uh, pretty doing pretty well. Um, these were spawned in a raceway system. Um, I think you have pictures of that. Um, it's an artificial river system because these are river fish. They're nest builders, so they have to be spawned in a moving water system. The golden shiners were spawned indoors and transported here um, to a part of the research project we're working on um, to see if we can raise them in an RAS or in an indoor system. So Barry, you talked about your research. Why, why are you working on this aspect of the bait industry? Minnesota is short thousands of gallons of fish, bait fish every year. Uh, no one seems to want to fix the problem except for opening the border up to importation. Um, DNR is, is not in favor of that. I'm not in favor of that. We and have enough invasive species as it is. And the current rule is that you cannot import bait to Minnesota. Right. Yeah. Can you tell me about where the water comes from, where the water goes, how's the circulation like? Well, both of these are fed from a pond back over here. Uh, the overflows come out of here. Um, these are actually airlifts, so it keeps the water up lower than the. In the uh, in the outflow. Uh, they run back through the ground, back into the other end of the pond. And it's a planted pond, so it has wetland um, plants in it that filter the water and sends it back through. The pond also provides a continuous supply of live food, um, copepods, daphnia, which I've seeded into the pond uh, over the winter, and, and I can do it over the summer. Right. And so, and these are buried quite a bit underground. Like, how far down did these go? These are five feet deep. Five feet deep. Okay. So, they make nice swimming pool. Swimming pool. Yeah. So, so, these are golden shiners that have been raised in the tank. Uh, these were three millimeter fry when I started, and that was about five weeks. Ago. Successful. If you're successful with this, what's your next step here? Well, this is actually it's framed out for a uh, greenhouse. Mm -hmm. um, the plan is uh, I use my greenhouses for season extension in my hydroponics. Uh, this facility was built with the same intention, doing the same um, over my ponds and over these tanks to be able to extend our growing season. Our problem in Minnesota is there are years where our growing season, where temperatures, water temperatures above 65 degrees, is only two months. Uh, that's a great problem when it comes to growing bait fish out. It regulates or, or it determines the availability of all types of bait fish in Minnesota. And at this point, we need better answers, and the answer is not importation. The answer is we can grow it here. We're land of 10,000 lakes. You're telling me that we can't grow our own bait fish in Minnesota? There's okay. a problem with that. And so have you run into any issues? You know, trying to step it out. Have you run into any trouble, problems, successes? What's been any barriers so far? Uh, this is the second trial okay. with this tank system. Yeah. Uh, 
the first one with the, with the common shiners and then the horny head does. Uh, the first trial, we I tried to scrimp by grinding my own feet. Um, point of order, that doesn't work. So what do you think are the biggest barriers to raising bait intensively in the Midwest region? In our region, I think it's probably available feeds. Okay. Uh, you're talking about minnows, so you're talking about smaller feeds and formulated for a fish that's not, uh, doesn't have the ability to digest vegetable protein. So Barry, what do you think about other bait peelers I think they'd be open to it when they get done with the science. The problem that we've encountered in the past is the science is incomplete and it needs to be scalable. And that's been the problem all along is if, it, if you can't scale up to the point where this is a, technically this is a toy. This is nowhere near capacity and you're not going to get rich and you're not going to make a good income off of something at this scale. This tank needs 50,000 fish in, not 5,000. Uh, it needs needs to be able to produce enough so that it's a viable income source. So it makes it worthwhile investment. If you buy one of these tanks brand new, you're looking at about $5,000. Um, I got lucky. I got them at an auction for about 150. dollars so, um, I'm trying to make it so that anybody can step into this. Uh, we need better answers. Barry, last time we were here, the pond was full of water. In fact, we'd be standing in water now, right where we're at. Um, the paddle wheel was going. Um, everything was looked really good. You had lots of minnows in here. And now we come back and things have changed. Can you tell us why that's happened? Okay. Technically, this is a an artificial river. Um, it has a flowing water. It moves in a circle here where the paddle wheel keeps the, the current constant. Um, the water level is maintained so that we don't have any variation in, in current dynamics. Um, I've drained it now so that I can get one, so I can get my fish out into the pond. Um, I don't need them expending energy in the current, and I don't need them, uh, it, 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 all it does is burn up excess food. Um, I also need to drain this down and dry it out so that it'll be ready for next year. This one's actually going to have the gravel taken out of it and a new liner put in it and be remodeled for next year. So Barry, looking around the pond here, there's little piles of gravel here and there. Did you place those there or what is the purpose of those? Well, every spring we level this entire raceway out. Uh, the piles are actually piles from built up by the horny head chub. These are nesting sites um, because they're nest builders and you can see quite a few of them. I've leveled some of them out and create a channel to allow the, the fry to get down to the to the uh, uh, sand pipe so I can get them out of here. So Barry, uh, more tricks in the trade here. This looks like a minnow trap of some type. Can you explain how this works and how I'm assuming you constructed this yourself? Yes, um, this is called a culvery trap. Um, they call it that because you got three entrances to it. Um, these are, we put these together ourselves. We use them, uh, use them for in my ponds here, and then we also use them for spot tail shiners and a few others in some lakes that we harvest. Um, we've got three entrances. Um, rules and regulations allow us only a certain distance for the, the size of the throats, which is right, right here. And then I make my own doors, which are slide out. Um, some of the other ones have smaller doors on them. I like the big ones because I can empty the trap easier and it's less damage to the minnows. Um, it just slides in, closes up, and then they just get thrown out into the pond, basically. So th before you throw it up, Barry, I don't see many traps with this sort of um, edging on them. What's, what's the purpose for that? Uh, it keeps me from tearing my hands up on the raw, raw wire. Um, the uh, Hardware cloth has got sharp edges on it, um, and if you're you've got your hands in the water all the time, your hands are softened. They tear really easy, Makes and sense. it's it's not a lot of fun when you do it. But for me, it's it's pretty simple. It's just a matter of drawing the trap out and let it letting it sink to the bottom, 
usually I'll use a bait bag in it, which will have fish food, uh, possibly chicken livers. This pond also has crayfish in it, so what I'll usually do the day before is go out and throw a trap in for crayfish, collect the crayfish, crush them up, throw them in a the trap, and then the fish will come into the crayfish. Great. So once you get minnows in the trap, and you have another piece of apparatus here, yeah. and what is that all about? This is a bar grater. Um, it actually, these are aluminum bars. Um, there's, these are spaced at, it's 1964 uh, inches, that's how they're measured out. Uh, this is to allow the smaller fish to go back in the pond without injury, so that I can catch them later, I continue to feed them and grow them up. Uh, Bear, you're kind of a community-minded person here in Staples, and I know for your bait industry, I'm sure you start locally, and for your produce, I know you've done a lot of local um, markets. Can you explain, you know, how you've kind of become part of the community as, as this business has grown? Well, most of my bait goes wholesale. I go to other people that deliver to the bait shops. I don't deliver to the bait shops directly myself. You know, do you go to journals to get your research um, information? Do you talk to other farmers? Do you talk to folks in academia? Or do you just kind of do it on your own? Uh, yes. <laughs> All of the above. Well, as you can see, we've transitioned from bait to hydroponics here in the tomato greenhouse that, that Barry runs. And it's quite, I think, a very impressive operation. And uh, one of the things we're interested in, Barry, is this is a aquaponics um, type of system, but it's different from what would be considered traditional aquaponics. Can you describe the differences and where the water comes from for this greenhouse and where it ends up? Well, all my greenhouses, I draw water from my ponds, um, which is an advantage because my groundwater here has such high iron that I could not use it in, in my hydroponics. The system here is technically aquaponics, but only vaguely. It's similar to what Superior Fresh is, uses. Um, no, uh, we draw water out of the ponds, but no water goes back to the ponds. Um, this is a drain to waste system designed by myself. Um, we have cherry tomatoes over on the overhead. We have beefsteak tomatoes um, growing in a what I consider a lay flat system. Um, this is a poly lay flat. It's got uh, a, basically a bag underneath. Um, the, the plants are grown in a in a three gallon uh, poly bag uh, filled with coconut husk um, or what they call coir. Uh, it's a reusable, uh, sustainable uh, media for growing plants. Um, I've been using it now for probably about eight years. Uh, it really works well and uh, the quality of the tomatoes is, is really good. What's the white bags up top there? Uh, these are my cherry tomatoes. These are bags that I designed myself. Um, right now my, they're kind of wilting because of the heat that we've got today. But um, these bags, the root system is in here. It's fed by a watering line over the top. Um, the same way as the rest of the tomatoes. They get one minute an hour every hour during daylight and then one minute every three hours at night. Um, they're fed a combination. Uh, right now they're being fed pure water, but this afternoon I'll, I will bring the nutrient strength back up to full strength for these um, and then adjust the pH so it's proper for the tomatoes. In an average year, what sort of production do you get as far as the tomatoes go and the various types that you're growing here? Well, we grow beefsteak, Roma, and cherry tomatoes. Uh, the beefsteak we put out about 5,000 pounds a year out of the 800 square feet um, building. Um, we, we grow about 1,900 pounds a year of Roma and then about 800 pounds of cherry tomatoes. So, Barry, these cherry tomatoes up top here, where did that idea come from, and has that been a pretty productive idea for your hydroponics situation here? Uh, it's, it came, um, you know, years ago they had a, what they call a topsy-turvy tomato system. Um, I, I watched people use them, and I watched um, how they failed, because the wind would catch the tomato and break it off of the 
So, and I wanted to increase the production. The, the profitability of high tunnels is by how much you can produce out of the building. Uh, but we grow in the bottom six feet of the building. Well, this building is 15, five, 15 foot six feet high, or six inches high. Um, we don't grow anything. Well, tomatoes like heat. Um, cucumbers like heat. So we, I, I design systems, bag systems for the roots, and we start growing across the trellis. It makes it easier. I don't have to train the, the cherry tomatoes, so it takes a lot, of, a lot less time on my part. And I've been really impressed with the with the level or the quality of the fruit. This is actually fun. Yeah. It's it's it makes it picking a lot easier. I don't have to go hunting down and tear my back up. Yeah. So tell us how you. I mean, tell us what you grow in here and how you kind of like came up with the idea of the aerial cucumber. <laughs> well, this is kind of uh, I, I been growing cucumbers in here now. This is seven years, eight years um, since I built the, put the building up. Um, I came up with this plan because I hate hunting cucumbers on the ground and because on the ground you end up with we got 13 striped gophers that eat them, uh, we got powdery mildew that gets them. Um, up in the overhead I have none of those problems and I don't have the problem of cucumber beetle which everybody else around here has. Um, plus we put a reusable shopping bag around our neck, put the strap around, open it up and just reach up and as we're going along and uh, this is a variety it's called Socrates it's a thin skin seedless cucumber um, it's parthenocarpic so it produces all female flowers all fruit um, doesn't need a pollinator and doesn't need bees and this building has 16 plants in it this year and produces over 200 pounds a week Last year we had 32 in here, and our best week was 440 pounds, oh, yes. or 440 pounds, I yeah. should say. Yeah. So we scaled back this year because COVID still hasn't righted our markets, and I didn't want to overproduce. As it is, anything that gets beyond this size ends up going to. I've got a pig farmer that has pigs that are eating very well. That's excellent. Who do you who do you primarily sell to? Who's your market for uh, We have uh, Sprout Food Hub in Brainerd. We have uh, the Brainerd Food Co-op. We have two co-ops in St. Cloud, or one, one in St. Cloud, one in St. Charles, um, or St. Joseph, rather. Um, and then we sell directly to Madden's Resort. So, and then we have local grocery that we sell directly to. All right, tell me a little bit about how your system works here from up above. Okay, just like in the tomato house, this is a three-gallon poly grow bag. It's filled with coir. Mm -hmm. uh, this is coir. It's a brick that we get. It's a compressed block. It's hmm. the outer husk of a coconut that's been shredded and composted. Um, we get pallet lo a pallet load of this every year. Um, it's uh, renewable. It's um, not much more expensive than peat. This is great, this is romaine. That's what romaine is supposed to look like. We, we like it, it's sweet. It doesn't get bitter, it doesn't have a bite. Um, and when I sell it, I sell it with a root system on it. It's five years um, seed accumulation and adapted to this system. Okay. See the root system? Oh yeah, well, I want to take down. Yeah. I duck into my head. I know. Okay. Yeah. I wanted something that I could bag quickly and something that wouldn't destroy the plants. I say my daughter and I um, could easily do 200 heads an hour this way. In fact, she'll be here Sunday morning. And we. We've got, um, she ships to Little Falls on Sunday, or Monday. Uh, we pick it on Sunday and put it in in that beautiful area. So this is my strawberry system. Um, this is actually my own design this year. It's a modification of the system that we used last year that has been producing exceptionally flavorful strawberries. They're delicious. Um, we pick about, there's... 500 plants in here, so we pick about uh, five, five and a half pounds every other day. So 
So maybe up to 20 pounds a week, and um, they sell as soon as they get, as soon as they're they're done. They're really good. Yeah. Of course, we save some because I like strawberry milkshakes, and there's nothing like a real strawberry milkshake. Awesome. And where does the water come from for your produce? This all comes out of the pond. So okay. technically everything here we're using some fish waste, but um, this also has a hydroponic strawberry nutrient that we're feeding to it okay. um, to get the quality that we want um, and the consistency that we want. Most aquaponic systems are deficient in iron, deficient in phosphorus, deficient in, in other nutrients that are essential to plant growth. So we add in whatever we use and then this is a recirculating system nothing goes back into the ponds but it goes back into a reservoir where we recirculate it over and over again by just by strengthening the nutrient and adjusting ph Great. okay barry we've seen the abundance of produce that you produce um quick question is do you store a lot of it or does it grow you pick it and it goes out the door i most of it goes the latter. If we pick it today, it's shipped. Can you explain why you think bait fish would be more beneficial for aquaponics in the region than, than food fish currently is? The key here, here is bait fish are worth 10 to $20 a pound. Bait fish in Minnesota is in short supply. What advice would you give to others for starting at least some sort of successful aquaculture, aquaponics business? Um, unlike others, I tell people to start small. Mm -hmm. um, it's a learning experience. Um, I was lucky, really lucky. I didn't have to learn all the lessons. I, I watched other people make, make mistakes and learn from them um, and tried not to repeat those mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, diversify your business so you're not, if you're going to start an aquaponics business, don't send all your produce or don't set your market all in restaurants or places that are subject to closure. We sell the food, hub, food hubs. They have CSAs, um, Community Supported Agriculture Systems, or programs going on. Um, we sell to local food co-ops um, and then we sell directly off the farm. I don't see an issue with any of them. In fact, uh, on-farm sales are pretty pretty good. I would be willing to um, set up a larger stand outside, but with the weather the way it is, setting anything outside is problematic. Um, so we have a, the number is up on our, our uh, sign, and we advertise through social media. Um, word of mouth spreads pretty fast. Yeah. You know, knowing what you know now, would you get into this business again? Yes, I would. Uh, the bait end of it, um, I would get into because I love being out in the, and, and there's nothing like being out by yourself in the middle of the nowhere, not another soul around, um, just me and the and the minnows. Um, the produce, uh, well, you've eaten it, I've eaten it, I I eat it continually. Yeah, I do that again. It's great. It's it's a lot of work. Um, it's farming, so I mean, it's a seven day a week job. So, um, yeah, I'd still do it. So if there's one thing you wish you knew when you started, what would have that been? Let me think about that <laughs> one. That's a uh, tough one. Yeah, it is. Um, it, what I, I wish I'd have known more about raising fish. You know, you've been at this a while now. Kind of where do you see yourself or your business in the next five to ten years? Well, we're, we're expanding out a little bit at a time. Um, I haven't gone to the bank for money. Um, I don't want to get into a lot of debt and then find out that I can't service that debt and lose everything. Um, and that's the advice I give other people. Start small, work your way in, use your profits to drive your, your business. If you have to work outside, do so. Uh, I think the most unusual thing I've seen is the cucumber house. I, I think it's just very interesting the way that Barry has raised the cucumbers off the ground so he can pick them without bending over. And they are just an interesting concept on how to grow things hydroponically. Uh, the most surprising thing was the greenhouse. Not the greenhouse itself, but I never knew where the water came from. And Barry lifted a, a, a 
thing, uh, you know, like a door in the floor, and here was all the water, and it comes pump from the pond, and it, and it spreads throughout the greenhouse. So I had no idea, you would have no idea looking there that that's where the water comes from. So that for me was really cool. To be honest, um, I actually hope that we'll see other people get involved in this. I've been an advocate of locally grown for a long time. I've been in the bait business for a long time. Both of them fall into uh, what I've been trying to get across to people. We can grow our bait here in Minnesota. We land of 10,000 lakes. You're telling me we can't produce our own bait? I mean, come on. Uh, we have the ingenuity. We have the people out there with the intelligence to do it. And we also have the market with the, the commodity that's valuable enough to justify the expense and the, the effort to do it. Thank you. We appreciate your time and your patience.